Hello everyone and welcome to international lectures on frontiers in geoscience organized by Department of Geology and Environmental Science, Trice College Autonomous and our alumni group Crystalline in connections with the Ruby Jubilee celebrations of our department and commencement of newly sanctioned MSc integrated program in geology by government of Kerala. It is indeed a proud moment and a matter of satisfaction that the department has completed successfully 40 years of its journey in imparting education. On reaching this Ruby Jubilee milestone, we take a moment to commemorate all the personalities behind this success, from the humblest to the highest functionary, and of course, the generation <clears throat> of students and teachers who made it possible. On this very special occasion, we are going to witness yet another joyful event, inauguration of a newly sanctioned MSc integrated program in geology by government of Kerala. Without further delay, let's begin. I now invite Dr. Linto Alapat to welcome the gathering. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Asha. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, a very good day, all dear participants and colleagues, and also resource persons today. Though it would be appropriate to say a good day because there are many people connected through this platform across different time zones from various countries. Uh, though this is a welcome note, let me begin with a note of thanks to God Almighty in making it possible to arrange an international lecture on frontiers in geoscience in, a con in connection with the Ruby Jubilee celebrations of our department and commencement of new five-year integrated MSc program in geology. The Department of Geology was initiated in the year 1981. That was also the year of Silver Jubilee celebrations of Christ College Autonomous Kerala. Over the years, the department has grown into a multi-dimensional with introduction of two PG programs, in one in environmental science and another one in applied geology, an additional UG program with physics and chemistry as complementary, and a PhD program, and now the recently introduced five-year integrated master's program in geology, which is part of the new generation courses that was inducted by government of Kerala this year onwards. The aim of this lecture series is to provide an opportunity for participants from India and abroad to come together to share and discuss scientific advances, questions, research findings, and challenges in the wide areas of geoscience. The lecture series includes invited presentations by eminent personalities, like uh, we have three speakers today, both from academia and industry around the world. To those who were invited to give presentations, I'm sure that you will have a rejuvenating experience in meeting young minds in geoscience that to be waiting to be molded. Let me go into my duty of welcoming all gathered here. Our principal, Reverend Dr. Jolly Andrews, who is continuous support, whose, whose continuous support has made this program possible. I welcome you, sir, to this program. I also would like to welcome today's speakers, Ms. Victoria Edmonds, Senior Engineering Geologist, Engineering Design and Project Management Infrastructure, Aitkins, UK. Ms. Edmonds is a chartered geologist with over 10 years of experience in engineering geology and geotechnical investigations, which includes reporting, design, construction, and project management in UK and also in Australia. She has previously worked on the ground investigations of Dinkley Point and Wilfa Newid. Prior to joining Aitkins, Victoria had worked for a site investigation in UK and geotechnical consultancy in Perth, Western Australia. She has experience in using a number of softwares, including Hallbase, Swedge, Rockplane, etc. She is working as a chartered geologist, as I've mentioned, and she has completed her master's in engineering geology at Imperial College London and master's of science in geology from University of Bristol. She is also certified construction skill certification scheme as an academic qualifi academically qualified person. 
with this brief introduction i welcome ms victoria admins to this meeting our second speaker dr edward demsey who is a lecturer in structural geology and geohazards at department of geography geology and environment <coughs> at university of hull uk dr demsey holds a phd in structural geology from university of liverpool with specialization in the kinematics rheology structure and anisotropy of the alpine schist derived from alpine fault zone milionites he has number of publications in the leading academic journals like geology journal of geological society journal of structural geology geological society london etc i welcome you sir to this meeting our third speaker dr agnes nawatni who was also my colleague uh, at liag she is an assistant professor at the department of physical geography institute for geography and geoscience at was lorand <laughs> university budapest hungary she holds a masters in physical geography hydrology from at was lorand university budapest and her, her phd was from fry university berlin and she has worked at leibniz institute for applied geophysics hanover germany on luminescence dating of lost deposits from hungary she has also holds a postdoctoral position at department of physical geography institute for geology and geography university of um, it was lorand university budapest hungary and she was also briefly worked as an assistant professor at the department of radio isotopes institutes of institute of physics sicilian university silesian university of technology poland with this brief introduction i welcome dr agnes nawatni to this meeting next i would like to welcome mr biju simon an alumnus of our department now working as an engineering geologist at uk actually it was his inspiration and hard work made this program possible today he was instrumental in inviting two of the resource persons today i welcome you sir to this gathering i would also like to welcome my colleagues each and every one in the department of geology and environmental science who worked with me to make this event possible i also would like to welcome all the participants across india and also from abroad who took time out of their busy schedule and have some online they have spent some online time here to attend this program i hope this series of lectures will create more questions in your mind and let these questions instill in you an interest in finding answers to these questions through the research or professional experience with these words may i conclude thank you everyone thank you sir let me now invite ran for the dr joli andrew cmi principal christ college autonomous for the presidential address over to you father i think you can all see and hear me yes father Dr. Lindo Alapar, the HOD of the Department of Geology and Environmental Science, and the distinguished resource person who are addressing the today's program, including Miss Victoria Edmonds, Dr. Edward, Dr. Agnes, from the University of Hull, UK. and from the budapest hungary the conveners of the today's program organizing secretary biju simon the crystalline pressure of the conveners mr c jo george and all the committee members i am very happy to note that the department of geology and environmental science is again hosting an international webinar today that to exposing and giving an opportunity to the students of the department of geology and environmental science to interact with the scholars of an international realm my sincere appreciation to the department of geology and environmental science special thanks to dr lindu alapath at this juncture i especially thank the resource person who have taken time to interact with our students i would like to pin 
point and to make a small word about our college which is at present having the enrollment ratio of around more than 4500 students the largest in kerala the southern state of india so this year also we are starting a new program msc integrated geology so i could probably say that we are one of the best i would say one of the best i would say as far as the india has been concerned and nation itself has been concerned i was hard in environmental science at this occasion for the initiatives i had taken in this juncture and it's up to you students to interact with the genius and the expertise of uh, the resource persons who are interacting from you uh, in a way because covid has helped us to come to the uh, uh, has helped us to provide an opportunity whereby we be able to speak with the resource persons of such near such caliber so have a wonderful time thank you so much thank you thank you father now we are going to begin our academic session i now invite mr biju simon crystal treasurer to introduce and welcome our first resource person ms <coughs> victoria edmund she is a senior engineering geologist from uk over to you sir okay thank you um thank you everyone um okay L uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce ms um, victoria edmunds um she is my ex colleague in uk and we worked together on ma <clears throat> various major projects in uk then she moved on moved to australia there she worked around a couple of years then she came back to uk and joined atkins and bristol and still we are good friends and she is our chartered uh, officer at western geological society uh, of geology um, of london and she holds as uh, dr lindo mentioned she holds an msc in geology <clears throat> from bristol university then she completed an msc in engineering geology from imperial college Uh, and she uh, she works as an an engineering geologist at Atkins Bristol. So let me take this opportunity to invite her to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, PG. So, it, so just to confirm, would you like me to start my presentation now? Is that the right time? Yes, ma'am. You can start now. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to share <clears throat> my. Green. If sorry, haven't quite. Let me start. Sorry, I think you'll everyone. be able to do it now because you are already a co-host now. Yeah. Brilliant. Let me share screen. Okay. Is this coming through for you guys? Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Okay. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. Or well, it's good morning in the UK for me. But thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, it's it's exciting to um, have all of you geologists on the call, and knowing that you're going to be able to do an extra year or so of study to get your master's certification um, for geology. It's always great to know that there's more more geologists coming into the the world to work so this talk um will discuss my career sort of what i went through academically but also i've worked at three different companies and i'll do a couple of projects um from my career um showing you how how as a geologist um i've used my experience to help help the industry and different clients and working in different industries the you'll be able to see in sort of um my 13 odd years of working that i've um yeah done quite a few different jobs and it's i've loved loved a lot of it so um here we go so this is what i will talk through probably about 40 45 minutes or so and then um i'm available to have questions at the end if anyone would like to discuss anything so my education and um career background first so in the uk when you're aged um sort of 16 17 18 you do two years of 
study um, either a college or a school. And most people, if they're going to go into universities, do A levels, although there are other subject um, um, certificates available. So I love science. So I did biology, chemistry, physics, and I did one year worth of maths. From that, I went on to Bristol University, so that's on the southwest of England, and studied straight geology. I was there for four years and came out with um, an MSci. So this is an, it's a bit of a weird degree. It's an undergraduate um, master's degree. So there's a bachelor's after three years. Some universities often offer this MSci, um, but then you can also go on and do a postgraduate MSc. So after I finished my geology degree, I actually went to work um, at the same company where Bijou is, Structural Soils, and I was there for three and a half years as a site investigation um, engineer, which I'll talk about. As Bijou said, I then went on to Australia to a company called 4D Geotechnics. At that point, I knew that engineering geology was the discipline I wanted to really work in, um, and because none of my formal education to that point other than maybe three weeks as part of my geology degree, had formally taught me anything engineering geology or geotechnics related. I went back to university and I did a formal master's at Imperial College in London, um, specifically on engineering geology. And that was for one year full time. After that degree, I then got the current job I'm in at Atkins. So in terms of work experience, after my undergraduate degree, I worked at Structural Soils in Bristol, which is where I met Bijou. Um, and I was a junior engineering geologist and I progressed to an engineering geologist. So I was there for yeah, about three and a half years. I then moved to Australia and did two years at a company called 4D Geotechnics. Um, similar work to what I did at Structural Soils, but it was a lot more interpretive work um, and just geology was completely different, which was great. It was between this 4DG and this Atkins job that I went and did my master's in London um, for one year. And then when I finished my master's, I looked to move um, to an international design consultancy where I could do more design work and again, more interpretive work and potentially look at more international and larger projects as well. So that's why I'm, I'm, and I'm still at Atkins now. I've worked in their Epsom office near London and I'm currently based out of their Bristol office and I'm a sen senior engineering geologist. So in terms of Atkins where I am now, um, we were actually taken over by a Canadian company called SNC Lavlin a couple of years ago, but we keep the Atkins brand. It's very well known in the UK and internationally. Um, and so it was decided a from a publicity and commercial point of view that we would keep um, yeah, the Atkins branding for our work. So in the UK, there's about 10,000 people working um, on all aspects of engineering. From a geology and geotechnical point of view, there's about 300 people in the UK. As part of SNC Lavlin, there's also geotechnical people in um, North America and in the Middle East. But as Atkins, we also have a geotechnical um, design team as part of our global design center in um, Bangalore or Bengaluru. And I think there's about <coughs> 100 people there. So we use them for some of our, apologies, our standard design work. But that office also brings in its own independent work, um, more local to India. So we work quite closely with the team over there. So these are just an idea of some of the big projects that Atkins involved with. I personally wasn't involved in it, but it just gives you an idea flavor of Atkins work. So 2012, we were heavily involved in the London Olympic Games. Um, again, all aspects of engineering, ecology and environment were involved in that. So that was a massive project, but Atkins also deals with a lot smaller projects where it's more local flooding um, or maintenance for roads or railways. And it could be a job that's only worth £5,000 maybe. Um, so we do everything from the million pound jobs down to the smaller jobs as well. Um, as Atkins, um, I quite like them as a company. I've been here eight, nearly nine years. Um, as graduates, you can join as part of their um, 
academy, Ground Engineering Academy, where you get a bit more mentoring. They really help you go towards chartership, either as a civil engineer or as um, a chartered geologist. And we work on a variety of projects, either UK based or international. As a geotechnical person within Atkins, you do a lot of desk study work, a lot of ground models. Um, we also do design and then we move on to construction supervision for some projects. So you see the full life cycle of a project from concept stage to construction quite often. So this slide is just me throwing ideas out of from doing a degree in geology. If you want to work um, in industry or education, there's there's so many different types of roles out there. Um, I work a lot. I'm an engineering geologist, but I work with geotechnical engineers who have more of a civils background. But as a geologist, you can end up having more of a design aspect and becoming more of a geotechnical engineer. The two is a fairly interchangeable um, job titles. Um, but I work with um, geophysicists, hydrogeologists, geomorphologists, coastal engineers, earthwork specific engineers. Um, we also just from publicity and from people's own um, passion, um, people write articles for either academic journals or for more public interest magazines um, about construction work we do and the geology. Um, the UK is moving a lot into storage of nuclear waste as well. So that's becoming a bigger bit of work in the UK. But we also work with academia and research um, when there's larger projects and we need um, work doing for new new technologies and new, especially digital related things. Um, it's the funding's a bit more complex, but um, it is great when we can get a close working relationship with certain universities. So my talk, sorry, will obviously focus more on being an engineering geologist um, slash geotechnical engineer. So as an engineering geologist, you can end up working in many different industries. So as part of construction, which is where I am, um, there's nuclear, rail, highways, ports and coastal. And I've worked in all of these. Um, currently, today, I have projects in the top three. So some people in their careers will specialize in just one of these, but geology especially, you can be quite um, quite varied in your career. Um, but you can end up oil and gas, mining, archaeology, forensics. It's not something Atkins um, specifically does, but there are people in the UK who do this work. Um, occasionally, we do do some litigation where there's um, claims against um, construction work that's a very specialist bit of work but there are people who do that and also the software we use for design and for ground models is developing all the time and although a lot of people come from more of a computer engineering background they need geologists to actually help them produce software that is usable so some people sit on the fence of being a geologist and a computer software developer so that's a growing business as well so more specifics about my career and what I've done. So when I was working at Structural Soils, it's a site investigation company. So it's gathering the ground, the data from the ground, understanding what what the geology is of a site you're going to investigate. Structural Soils actually owns their own rigs. Um, this type of rig I'm showing on the screen is called a cable percussive drilling rig. Um, it's good for going through superficial deposits. It can't penetrate um, most rocks, maybe a very weak mudstone for a small amount, but it's better for, for clay, sands, gravels. Um, the material that comes back out is quite typically just in a pile of soil. You can take tubes of material to get some undisturbed samples and you can go down to about 30 meters, sometimes a bit deeper, but 30 meters is more typical. Um, you can do sort of 10 meters a day maybe so it's it's a relatively efficient method it's not loved in the uk because the types of samples are not always great for laboratory testing and it's considered maybe a potentially dangerous um, from a health and safety point of view not um, a great system of working there can be quite a few injuries to the workers but it's still used as being a relatively cheap way of obtaining ground um, model information and samples for laboratory testing. These pictures are actually taken from Wilfred Neweth, 
Bijou was up there logging all of these samples that came out the ground. And at the time I was actually working for Atkins. So on the consultancy design side, and we did hundreds of boreholes up on this site. It was for a new nuclear power station. In the background of the picture on the right, you can see the old power station that's being decommissioned currently. Um, and in the fields, you can see that um, where they're drilling, they're planning on building a new power station. Unfortunately, the company that was investing in this um, has pulled their funding, so it's not progressing at the moment. But um, there are thoughts within the UK that maybe a different company might come on board um, to take up the land and to progress with a nuclear power station on that site. The geology here is glacial material um, over some phyllites and samites, so metamorphosed mudstones and sandstones. So we, the superficial deposits are really variable in thickness. Sometimes you've only got about a meter thick, sometimes it's about 30 meters thick. So the variability came from the glacial deposits and we're right near the coast. So there's been a lot of erosion over the years. But when you get down to the bedrock, um, it was very hard and Although it was interbedded phyllites and samites, um, the actual geology from a geotechnical point of view of what you're building on was actually fairly consistent because it was all very hard rock. So different type of um, investigation technique is trial pitting. Um, you use a big backhoe or JCB type machine and you dig a hole in the ground. Again, only suitable for soils, um, so sands, clays and you can get to about four meters depth. You, the samples you get back are called undisturbed samples and they're fine for most simple um, classification tests that you wanna do in the laboratory and they're useful for contaminated ground testing as well. Again, quite a cheap way of investigating the ground if you only really need to know about the shallow um, material. You can do maybe eight of these in a day in a field if the access is good. But if you're working in more of an env urban environment, you might only be able to do a couple of a day. Um, so it's trial pitting. And then for bedrock, you've got rotary core drilling. So this uses um, <clears throat> a powerful rig, diesel fueled, and it rotates um, a drill bit, um, thousands of rotations a minute, or at least hundreds of rotations a minute, with a cutting edge on the bottom of the drill core and you produce a, um, a tube of rock effectively, a cylinder of rock that's cut out of the ground, typically in one and a half meter lengths and about 100 to 150 millimeter diameter. Um, the drill rigs we had are able to produce very high quality core and it meant the loggers were able to log to great detail, seeing all the fractures, the changes of bedding, and we're able to get great samples for our laboratory testing to understand the strength, the stiffness, um, and many other aspects, especially faulting that was happening in this area. These, for geotechnical aspects, typically in the UK, you'd probably only go down to 30 or 40 meters, but for nuclear sites, because um, you've got to really pay attention to what um, faulting might be happening at depth, some of our boreholes went down to about 180 meters depth. So again, for construction purposes, this is probably the maximum depth you'd ever go to. Um, you'd use similar rigs in an oil and gas industry and in mining, but they'd be they'd be much larger. But the idea is similar, and you could go to hundreds of meters, even kilometers depth. But for our rigs, um, more tens of meters is typical. You can do from these boreholes down the whole tests, so geophysical tests or water permeability tests. Um, and it, this again is taken at Wilfer. And we did a lot of geophysics tests to help us supplement the logging and the lab testing that went on so we could have a continuous record, like an optical um, image of the whole borehole and <clears throat> help us get orientation in details for the fractures but also information on density. Um, I can't remember some of the, there were about five different tests the geophysics came back with. So it was very useful and relatively quick once you drilled the hole. So sorry, if we also for rotary drilling, you can put it on um, a jack up barge and you can drill offshore or in the near shore area. So for Wilfer Newth, um, we had to understand where the outfall and the intake for the cooling water for the nuclear power station was going to go. 
So we did um, about 20 odd boreholes just off the coast. And so the drilling techniques the same, but just logistics of setting up the weather conditions, the tides make this much more complex operation. And the fact that Jackup Barge is involved, it's obviously a lot more costly. So rotary drilling on shore is um, expensive, is sort of thousands of pounds per hole. But if you're offshore, you're, you're tens of thousands of pounds per, per borehole. So you do a lot less of them and you've got to really pay attention of where you're placing your holes that you really want them in that location. So this is me working in Australia. Sorry, let me just take um, The central Pilbara area is up in the northwestern side of Western Australia. It's a semi-arid environment, um, completely different geology to what I'd experienced in the UK. This project was um, it's for a mining company that was going to be mining iron ore, um, and they wanted to set up a new um, storage area. But you don't want to put your storage area on top of where there might be good ore. So they do what they call a sterilization program where they check the ground where they want to do place their storage area to make sure there's not good ore underneath. They do a lot of what we call open hole boreholes where you don't come back with a stick of rock, you come back with chippings. And as part of these boreholes, they also did geophysics. Um, some of it surface geophysics like ground penetrating radar um, and some of it down the hole where they did optical um, radars and they were also looking for some voids because we had some evaporites in the area that we had cavities underground here um, that's where the cavity laser scanning the image on the left came in so we were able to cover an area that was um, about one kilometer squared maybe in a couple of weeks and get quite a good makeup um, of the site. With mining, there's a relatively quite a lot of money in the industry and they were willing to pay for a few different techniques because it wasn't clear with the superficial deposits here which um, geophysical um, method would potentially show us the best images for, for the voids that could be down there. Um, we were able to trial a few different methods, which is great because quite often a client isn't willing to pay for different methods and you just have to go for for what you think is the best option. So these were some of the results we got. The top right shows um, the camera that was put down and we could see the voids. None of them were huge. It was much more of a honeycomb situation going on. Um, the images below are what the geophysics interpretation was showing us. We had boreholes to correlate the data. So the top image shows that um, where there's yellow data, it, there was a void in the borehole. And we could kind of cross correlate that to what we were seeing in the geophysics. However, it didn't always match up um, with there being voids in, in the borehole and the geophysics showing potential voids. It was helpful to show that the ground was quite variable and that we might be able to expect these honeycomb voids potentially anywhere under our area. And it, but it was more the cavity um, scanners that were able to give us confidence that there wasn't one single massive void. It was much more of a honeycomb situation. So sorry, this jumps around a bit. This is um, back to Wilfer actually, but it's we did geophysics at the Wilfer Newest site in the UK as well. And this was a magnetic um, electromagnetic survey that was taken. Um, and you can see it actually picks up power lines very well, which are the red kind of lines coming through from the existing um, power station here. But it was also able to pick up some um, dikes, geological dikes that were happening in the area um, that we saw on boreholes. But with just a boreholes a few hundred meters apart, it wasn't easy to necessarily see where the dikes were going. So the magnetic data was excellent in being able to help pick out those, or at least the shallower ones. Um, with Wilfer, we were able to, we had so many boreholes, we were able to create a 3D model. We used um, Hole Base, which is now called Open Ground, um, owned by Bentley. The software is a geotechnical database for all our different borehole and laboratory testing data. Um, 
we were then linked it to the 3D civils software to be able to visualize our borehole sticks. And we classified our boreholes, not by lithology, but we sort of linked it more to strength because from a geotechnical point of view, this is more what we cared about. So the green in these borehole sticks, the dark green are very good material. The light green are, are pretty good material. And once you get into the red, the purple and the yellow, um, you're getting into material that's a lot more broken up, a um, lot more fractured and a little bit weaker. The blue is the superficial material. On the image on the left, we'd actually removed the superficial material from the borehole sticks. So we were more interested in the, the bedrock. As you can see, we did some inclined boreholes, which was really helpful in picking up vertical discontinuities and helping us identify orientations of faults. The optical log images we got were very clear. The image you're seeing here is not great, but that's just because of my copying from, um, from a PDF, not because of the actual image. Um, if you had the original document, you'd be able to zoom in here, very clearly see the geology. But the area in the red dash is um, a fault that was logged. So this is it in the optical image. Then on the bottom left is what it's like in the actual borehole sticks. So you get quite a lot of clay, um, infill where there's been movement along the fault and then the red box in the 3d model is where it is on the borehole stick so we actually worked with another consultancy who was specializing in the fault modeling and they're the ones who linked up between each of the boreholes where the faults were in their orientation and put actual planes through it so we were able to have a 3d model we could present to the client that had about 20 significant fault planes crossing the site and they were able to get a great orientation of them, see the depth of them and also have confidence in how significant a fault they were. And it was all very visual, which is great because a lot of people who are non-geologists find it harder to see or understand in 3D how everything links together without seeing a model. Um, sorry, back to um, Australia, <laughs> moving around. So with uh, um, being some of my work out in Australia, the ground is a lot more exposed. They don't necessarily have full vegetation coverage or urban environments in the same way we do in the UK. So from a geological point of view, it's great. You can actually do some on-site mapping and be able to see the ground quite clearly. So the large image on the left, we've got some um, iron heavy material coming through. We used, um, they're called Tough Books, which has a GPS link to it. So we could write notes and see exactly where we are because we had satellite images um, loaded onto the, the Tough Books. Um, and what we were looking for was understanding where there was bedrock outcropping, where there was calcrete, where there was superficial sort of gravel deposits or where there was more sandy alluvium deposits on the surface. And so we walked the area and just made notes and drew annotations on the satellite images that when we got back to the office in Perth, we could digitize that up into maps. Um, so as I said before, they did sterilization boreholes over a certain area to confirm that um, there wasn't a massive void underneath where they were planning on putting their stockpile of ore material. So they cleared the vegetation It's about 30 meters between each borehole so each of these squares you can see with cleared vegetation is where they do a borehole and they did these open holes so you get back chippings here unlike the sticks of rock so the same drill rig could produce a stick of rock or it could produce chippings it just depends on the setting and the drill bit um, that's put on it open hole drilling is a lot quicker but you obviously don't get the sample for lab testing or detailed geological logging but for this purposes, we were just looking for voids and we were looking for iron ore material. Um, so these, each of these little piles represents a three meter drilling zone. Um, and the loggers, um, so the drillers would put little piles together and then the geologists would be able to come along, count up the piles, see what depth you're at. And we were able to see the change between the superficial deposits into a paler colored calcrete and then into a dolomite that was the kind of dark gray. Um, but there were voids that came in and they just leave a gap between their little piles of, of dirt. So we had voids in the calcrete, but we also had voids in the dolomite as well. And as I said before, the, the optical log showed us that these voids were not single massive 
caves. They were more of a honeycomb nature, but that wasn't able to be picked up with just the drill logs. They weren't sensitive enough to pick that up. So the, the mapping we did using the satellite image and our walking around on the ground from the logs we took on the tough book, when we came back to Perth, we digitized our mapping overlaid it with the stockpile and the plant that the client wanted to put in. And we were able to see where they were going to be placing their plant in terms of where there was um, voids or calcrete. I mean, this is just the surface map showing more of the geomorphological and superficial deposits of alluvium, different types of alluvium, different types of calcrete. But it gives you quite a clear image um, to be able to understand what's going on. So moving on to more of my work related to Atkins. So currently I'm working quite a lot in the nuclear industry um, at Atkins. In the UK at the moment, we've got quite a few nuclear power stations dotted around the country, but they're all either at the end of their life and they're going through decommissioning or they're very close to coming near the end of their life. The government has identified quite a few potential new sites around the UK. Most of these are adjacent to existing sites. As was mentioned in the introduction, I'm working quite a lot at Hinkley Point. Um, this is next to an existing power station, but they're already about five years into construction of the new power station with about another five years till it's online. So that's down in the southwest of England, down, um, down here in um, Somerset. So this is related to Hinkley Point, this geology. So it's right next to the coast. So you get quite a nice section um, of the geology through the close coast. So the over overburdens the quaternary um, soils, but then you also get blue lias material. So kind of mud mudstone that's kind of gray with a bit of a blue tint in it. It's also got some limestones in it, um, grading to more thicker limestone beds. Um, and then you get more mudstones coming in at a deeper depth, but fairly consistent near horizontal beds. Um, not too bad for building a nuclear power station on, relatively speaking. So from all the boreholes that were created for Hinkley Point and the logging, um, the geologists were able to create a 3D model um, and they overlaid it with the excavation that was planned for the deep dig for the two new nuclear power station reactors. And you can see most of the excavation is going to be within the blue lias. Um, However, there's a bit of the little stop formation that comes in um, at the, this is the southern end of the site in the main deep dig area. And then for some auxiliary buildings to the south even more, um, you get some of the Westbury and the little stop coming in as well. Fred, I wasn't involved in creating this model, but I was on site looking at the, the rock slopes part of the deep dig in this area. So to minimize the excavation for Hinkley Point, they kept the excavations as near vertical as possible. Um, and although the mudstones were, were fairly competent to be able to stand upright, there were a lot of faults that came through the area. And with it being a mudstone that had a lot of pyrite in it, if you left the, the natural ground exposed to the air, it would have oxidized. And within a couple of days, that mudstone would start degrading, um, first just breaking up um, into sort of more gravel sized pieces and eventually it would have turned to a, a clay. So we sprayed it with shotcrete to protect it from the elements. Where there were faults coming through, we put a lot of um, ground nails in to help stability. Also because on the top of these slopes, there were sometimes quite heavy loads going in for construction. So quite large cranes that had to be supported. This image also shows you the level of detail that goes to confirming the bedrock and cleaning so on a lot of construction sites, if you're building houses or something, you get down to bedrock, you'd roughly clean off the surface and then you pour some concrete. But for a nuclear power station site, we had to make sure we didn't leave any gravel behind um, and the geologists could really log the bedrock, see it clearly, see all the fractures, take photos, take laser scans. So they use this VACEX, which vacuum excavator to suck up the gravel and the small sandy pieces that were left behind. So this is sort of, they're doing this on some other sites, but it's Hinkley points where it was used um, everywhere and quite extensively. You can follow um, 
the Hinkley Point Power Station on Twitter. So they give quite regular updates with some good photos of what stage stage they're at, if anyone's interested. This is another rock face that um, was not so onerous, didn't have a uh, fault going through it and didn't have to take such heavy loads on the top. So a lot less nails needed to be installed. As well as logging the horizontal um, base, the geologists also logged the vertical faces before they were covered with shotcrete. So this gives you an idea of um, the geologist logging part of the vertical face, making their notes, um, measuring the fractures, measuring um, the strength of the rock, giving it a geological strength index rating, GSI, um, and then the face would get sprayed. And because of the degradation of the face, all this had to work within, um, I think they had a maximum 48 hours from when the face was exposed. So with Hinkley Point, there was 24 hour working. So they had multiple shifts going on for the geologists. So there was always someone available to log log a face and at night they had lights spotlights on the area so you could work wasn't the best but it's better to do it in daylight but it meant the site could progress um, this is another area of Hinkley Point where near the sea they had to put in um, a piled wall to help retention at the top of the wall they've put an access road but just the other side of that is basically the Bristol Channel and this gives you an idea again of the level of cleaning that's gone on for the base um, base of the ground before it gets covered by a blinding layer of, of concrete. Um, you can see the shallow dip of the beds here, but generally from a geotechnical point of view, it's quite consistent ground here and good for construction. The bottom right picture here is the geologist marking up the fractures before they take um, dips and strike measurements and persistence and spacing. And they record all that on them. Um, they have tablets, so it all gets put in input digitally again before this will get covered over with blinding concrete. So you only have a small window of opportunity to log it um, before it gets covered over and you can never see it again. Just for interest, um, we managed to get some historical pictures from Hinkley Point A that was constructed in the 1960s, I think it was. So they had vertical rock faces, but shotcrete wasn't really invented then. So these vertical faces got left exposed. And it was quite dangerous because um, the workers at the bottom quite often had bits of rock falling out of the faces. But the concept in some ways was the same, that they had near vertical faces. They excavated the shapes that they required. Um, and there was a lot of concrete and reinforced steel put in to, um, for the power station. Um, so yeah, comparison of the vertical faces from Hinkley Point C and Hinkley Point A. Now, this is another project I'm working on. So away from the nuclear industry, this is um, a highways project in South Wales. It's called the A465, and it's about eight kilometres of road that was a single carriage A road. So not our biggest roads in the UK, but quite significant. Because it was quite in Wales, there's quite a hilly area in South Wales. Um, so you couldn't enlarge your roads very easily and it was becoming very congested. So they wanted to make this single carriageway road into a dual carriageway road. And it's in a bit of a gorge right next to our Brecon Beacons National Park. Um, so to create it into a dual carriageway, we had to either cut away a lot of the slope on um, generally on the northern side and build up the slope in the gorge on the southern side to be able to create us two extra lanes. There also needs to be access. Um, in the UK, when you do dual carriageways, you need to have free slip roads coming on and off the roads. You don't want to have um, T-junctions where cars come to a standstill to join the traffic. They need to have the slip roads to join at speed. Um, and so we needed a lot of space for the slip roads. And we also had to have access roads um, over the top of the road because the dual carriageway had to be free flowing without junctions. Um, where traffic was crossing it and we ended up adding some pedestrian footpaths across the road because they say there's a national park just to the north of here so we needed good access for tourism as well. So this photo shows you some of the designs so this bridge was one of the landmark bridges. One of the issues with this area in South Wales is you have a lot of um, coal mining or historical coal mining so there's a lot of voids in the area and they weren't very well mapped when they first put in. So we ended up doing a lot of test holes around this area, probing to see if there were voids from the coal industry. 
and we had to backfill with um, a grout mix to ensure the stability that we could take the load of the bridge. So there's a lot of preparation work in this area before you could actually start building the foundations for the bridge. Um, the left hand side shows you um, a slope that's cut into a weak mudstone and nailed ground nailed to help stability. Um, it grades into actually a gravel covered slope where we had to build it back up to ensure there was space for this roundabout behind it. Um, again, we cut access roads um, to make sure the gradients for the none of the roads were too high and that there was enough visibility to make the roads safe in this area. Uh, so this is another same project, different areas of the site. So this is where we had to build up to create two new lanes for the highway um, at the top of this area. So this area, when the geological ground investigation happened, showed there was an old um, landslide potentially in this area, and there was a lot of made ground. There used to be a line uphill. There used to be a lime kiln 100, 100, 200 years ago, and they used to tip the material over the edge of the lime kiln down into this valley. So there was 10 or 20 meters thick of, of deposits that were just um, granular having been placed there in the last sort of few hundred years. So they had to be removed to a certain extent, but we couldn't remove all of them. So one of the first jobs was to create ourselves a working platform. Um, the contractor then put piles about 30 meters deep um, in a row along the base here to ensure we socketed into the natural ground that was deeper than the landslide. We then capped on the left hand picture, those piles have a capping beam to help spread the load. And then we started filling in behind. So behind this capping beam, we started placing granular material with a geotextile layer to help strengthen it. All these nails on the left on the back slope are, are temporary works effectively. Um, they're needed for the stability of this slope while the road's at the top. But when the permanent design is completed, they're the reason for them is superfluous will have buried them by the time this gets finished but it was a good few months of work just to prep the site before we could start the permanent works um, other solutions we used were gabion baskets um, they help add weight to the slope so in some areas we had a lot of groundwater problems although we'd nailed the slope the superficial deposits turned to like a slurry um, and it little mini landslides occurred so we ended up adding weight to the face of the slope to hold the natural ground in place. Um, and gabion baskets were visually decided to be um, acceptable and were relatively quick to add, uh, to place and put weight in. So this is another area of the site where we had to dig away a lot of the natural rock to create us um, slip roads and access ramps adding in extra bridges to ensure free flow of traffic. Um, and then we had to build up the road to create extra room for the lanes. So in some areas where we needed a vertical face, we did this Rico panel walls where there's um, compacted granular material going in behind the wall. And there are also some metal straps um, helping secure the wall. Where we could have get enough space for a 70 degree slope, we were able to vegetate the face and there's um, again granular material, but it's with a, a kind of plastic geotextile, but it gives a better a better aesthetic when you can um, vegetate the face here. But the maximum slope angle for that was about 70 degrees. Um, I think the geology here is the lower coal measures. So you get a mixture of mudstones and sandstones with some coal beds coming through. And I think this might be my last picture. This, I've not been involved in tunnel work, but Atkins and the geotechnical industry do do a lot of tunneling. So again, it can be in hard rock or soil, but quite typically the deeper tunnels are obviously in hard rock. You get a lot of different um, machines doing drilling. You can drill and blast. Again, shotcrete to support it. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but it's just giving you an idea that people in the geotechnical industry do work in tunneling and underground space. Oh, this is my final summary slide. So it's just my experience because I've had three worked in three different companies and I've worked on a contractor's side, so at Structural Soils and 4DG. I've worked on a consultancy side, so where I am at Atkins. But as part of Atkins, I've also been seconded to the client side where I worked for Hinkley Point C and EDF Energy on the client side. They all bring their different challenges, but 
it's enjoyable to have seen the perspective from all three sides of the industry and see what their challenges and opportunities are because I think until you've worked on all those different aspects of a project you can't necessarily fully understand the life cycle of the project and where you can bring lessons learnt and add benefit. So quite typically the contract is the one either doing the factual work if it's gathering data or um, actually doing the construction work on site if you've got to the stage of construction. Consultancies quite often do the interpretation um, and the design work, but they quite often manage projects as well, the life cycle of a budget or aspects of just mobilizing to site. Some clients are very hands on and they can actually be um, almost a designer in their own right. Um, but some clients are they're not very technically minded and they're just putting up the money and all they want to know is when when they're going to get their deliverable or when their their site's going to be finished in construction. So you do have a lot of different clients. You've got to manage their aspirations and help them where you can. All three um, of those different jobs I've kind of done have been a fairly Monday to Friday, nine to five type job. Although I have had to do some weekend work, I have had to do some night shifts, but it's not been my typical rota. Some people want that and they look for that in a job. Um, other people don't. Also, there's a mixture of working overseas and working from home or just working within the UK, but away from home. So again, contractors quite often end up having to work away from home, whereas consultancy staff and clients quite often are able to work work at home or from your home office you're not traveling around so much but not always true depends on on the role and then size of projects I've moved my through my career generally getting working on bigger and bigger projects but that's not necessary for everyone some people prefer the smaller projects where you can um you see the life cycle from the concept stage to completion within a year or less and it's very quick. I've been working on Hinkley Point style projects where it's tens of years from concept stage to, to completion. Um, and I probably prefer the larger projects, but there's pros and cons of both. All right, thank you, everyone. That's the end of my presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat box or I guess unmute your microphone and, and ask. Participants, you can ask questions now. You can unmute yourself or you can post your question in the chat box. <clears throat> no, if there's no questions then. Thank you very much for letting me talk. Time. Hello, do, okay. uh, do you want to add something onto it or else we may go to the next talk? Um, no, I think I think that's all I've got. Um, but thank you very much for letting me talk. It's a great opportunity. That's great. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Biju, do you want to say something to it or want to conclude? Um, uh, no, that's fine. I think, yeah, I think. I think um, I think people should ask <laughs> some questions. Yes. Uh, it's an opportunity for everyone to interact, you know, with uh, Victoria. And yes, yes. She yes. has already yes. shared her experience in engine geology, so I think people should feel free to interact with uh, Victoria just for a few minutes. 
have you got any uh, company have you got any website in india also for your company yes Sorry. so we have this hi yeah. um we have a global design center atkins global design center based in bangalore and they employ i think about 100 geotechnical people okay uh -huh. i'm afraid i don't know what attributes they're looking for in terms of if people need master's degrees or what what degrees they're looking for for that but the company um some of the work they do at that bangalore office is for the uk and they do the design work for us but some of it they do work they win themselves in india that mm -hmm. the uk has we don't get involved um they manage the whole project they win clients and like the projects i was talking about um yeah they'll do work um in india for indian clients um yeah. but also mm -hmm. many people are involved in in the hinkley point project i was talking about if wilfa gets progressed we would need um the gdc the global design center to be doing the design for that so yeah i think at the moment we just have one mm -hmm. office over there but what I afraid I don't know is if they um yeah are going to set up satellite offices or at least now with COVID allow people to work at home that it can be spread further yeah. around India. Yeah, you mentioned uh, of course you had shown number of projects that you have been involved with. Uh, so as a ge engineering geologist, could you please tell me what exactly a student should have minimum requisite to get into the sector? So probably they can go for some kind of uh, course though they have completed their masters in geology or applied geology. To be eligible for an engineering geologist, they must have certain set of skills or requirements. So could you please elaborate on that? So <laughs> if you work more for contractors, it's yeah. it's more a straight geology degree, being able to show that this is more specific to the UK. I'm afraid I don't know what the requirements would be in India, but in the UK it would be people who have like a driving license they're willing to geologists you've got to go visit you've got to visit your rocks and you've got to visit your site so you've got to be able to travel um so it's people who have a driving license able to move around the uk have um skills to be able to talk to the clients because quite often as a contractor you won't have your boss with you on site you'll be going yourself to site so you have to be confident enough to be able to talk to the client talk to the the drillers um but it's having an attitude to learn because you're in your first jobs. No one expects you to know everything. And what you're taught at university is useful and academic, but it's um, you're not necessarily taught how to write reports or exactly the same design that's required of how a company does their, their processes and their methodology. But just to be willing to ask um, the right questions. Um, so for a contracting kind of role, just a good geology degree, being able to show you've got field work and that you're willing to learn. For working at a consultancy like Atkins or the bigger consultancies, they probably are looking for a master's specific to the industry you're working in. So engineering geology or nuclear, or if you want hydrogeology or contaminated land, the fact that you've gone and done one extra year to specialize in the subject. Um, they wouldn't expect you to be chartered straight away because you have to have industry experience. But if you go, so in the UK, you can usually get chartered after about five years experience. Um, they are looking for you to be wanting to get chartership as a consultancy because it shows you're willing to take on ownership of designs and responsibility. And you've got that, you've got that knowledge of bringing it all together. You're not just, um, producing factual data, you're interpreting the data and you're understanding what the client wants. Because um, there's no point in doing doing a great geological map, but it, you're doing it for a client who wants a bridge, but actually you've given him information that's related to a nuclear power station. You need to understand what the client wants and be able to present that data in a report or in a presentation for, for how the client's gonna use it. Um, so communication skills are useful as well, but early in a career, it's it's getting out and seeing um seeing a lot of different geology. To be, I think one of my mentors told me that the best geologists are the ones who've seen the most amount of rocks 
and definitely true in my industry that the people with the best knowledge when they get later in the career are the people who spent the most amount of time out on site either as ground investigation or as construction but if you just sit in the office just doing design work you'll be good at a very particular thing but you won't have a wide range of knowledge so on a cv for a a new job it's being able to show you have that in field experience i guess you have mentioned a uh, lot many number of softwares that you have used uh, i mean i see that you are expertise in that uh, so do you have any specific software knowledge that students should have uh, in order in order to be able to do the job they never if you're coming in as a graduate um they don't require it it's not you won't not get a job because of the software but mm -hmm. if you're coming in with a few years experience um it's not necessarily one particular bit of software but they'd want you to see you've used some so from a geology point of view it's quite often in engineering geology so slope stability software like so slope w or there's there's sim there's many different bits of software that do slope stability um or rock rock slope stability so there's software called slide rs2 udec um i don't know how to use all of these because they're quite they can be quite specific that only certain people know how to use each one sometimes it's just having an awareness of when you want to use a particular bit of software for a task um you, it's more it's useful to be able to write even if you're writing the bid proposal to a client to know how the software works what we're doing more of in the uk now is um 3d ground models um in digital space to be able to present them to the client. There's no one bit of software that's better than others at the moment, but we there's ones called Leapfrog or Ground Groundhog, Leapfrog, 3D Civils. Um, I think there's another one. We're trialing a few different ones. We don't, it's all quite new. There's no particular one that's coming out as better, but just from a early, geologist early in their career, creating 3D ground models is key and being able to present those 3D ground models to a client, showing them where the risks are for them as to understanding if you've got a client who's trying to do some mining and they want to know where their gold is, as opposed to if you've got a client who wants to build an underground railway station um, or yeah, being able to take that 3D ground model and not just present factual data, but present interpretive data relative to what the project needs is quite a key key skill. And it's it's not so linked to the software. It's more, even if you hand drew it, yeah, it, it's showing you've got that knowledge. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I must uh, thank Ms. Wicks uh, for taking your time. Uh, I, I mean, when we initially uh, put forward this idea of having an invited lecture from you, you are always uh, willing to come forward to interact with our students. And of course, uh, Mr. Biju Simon had given a word with you already uh, that uh, it would be interesting to listen to you from our side, from our students' point of view. So thank you so much. Uh, it's time for moving on to the next talk. It was truly uh, interesting and uh, very insightful to listen to you and your experience in the field of engineering geology. Thank you so much. No, thank you. For thank you. Good luck to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Now, let me invite Mr. Jamon Sunni, Assistant Professor, Department of Geology and Environmental Science, to introduce our next resource person, Dr. Edward Dempsey from University of Hull, UK. Over oh, to you, you, sir. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Yes, you can hear, I hope. Uh, okay. So, my job is to uh, give an introduction to Mr. Eddie, alias Dr. Edward Dempsey. He's a lecturer in structural geology and geohazards in the Department of Geography, Geology and Environment in the University of Hull, UK. He has been there from April 2017 till present. Before that, 
if you look at his career he did his bachelor's in geology honors in 2005 and later he did his phd in 2007 to 2010 he completed this phd the topic of his phd was that the kinematics rheology structure and anisotropy of the alpine schist derived alpine fold zone melonites he did his phd from the university of liverpool later he was doing a postdoctoral as a research associate to professor bob holsworth in durham university he was a teaching fellow there from 2014 to 2017 assisting the university today he is going to give a talk on the topic the greatest power couple in modern geosciences structural geology meets geochronology i feel compared to the stratigraphy the structural geology is a in field or in the site is a complex thing which needs dating which due to constraints in funding and technology was not very commonly employed till recently so the usage of geochronology in structural geology will give us a more inputs into the Uh, into the top uh, into the science of structural geology as well as the origin of various structures in the origin of earth over to you dr edward dempsey hello uh, thank you very very much for inviting me to come and talk to you all uh, it's a pity i can't actually be there in person to to meet you but i suppose zoom will have to do for now um I'll I'll share my screen and just uh, get get cracking on. Uh, bear with me one second. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. So I'm going to talk to you about. what i feel is the the greatest power couple in modern structural and modern geoscience and that is the the ability to combine traditional structural geology with modern cutting edge geochrono geochronological techniques and that's kind of a very new field at the moment it's only come about in the last really 10 years or so and myself and my colleagues at uh, my my previous institution Durham University have really been driving this uh, this field um so what are the aims of of actually doing that and uh, really what i want to do is i want to start actually characterizing mineralized fracture zones so when i've got fracture zones within orogenic belts they often have various minerals in them and trying to understand what those minerals are actually able to tell us about the structural geology so we need to get a good grip of mineralogy we need to get a good grip of kinematics actually understanding how these faults move where they've been where they've ended up ultimately then is to try figure out what the paleo stress configurations are what was the stress conditions in the earth's crust during the past how have they changed over time if you can understand the stress regimes in the past you can start making predictions about fracture patterns and things like that which are of great importance for things like the mining industry engineering like we've heard before or the hydrocarbon industry and today it's becoming more and more important for things like geothermal exploration and carbon capture and sequestration what we really want to be able to do is give an actual apparent age to the relationships of these fractures how they've got how the fractures are formed what mineralization has happened but specifically when did that happen and that's always been an issue for us so my geological analysis as an academic geologist can it takes a very predictable route i start off with my field analysis i am an active field geologist there's nothing i enjoy more in geology than actually going out and looking at the rocks in the field 
getting up into the mountains, down into the valleys and seeing what these faults and fracture zones look like. After that, I generally have thin sections of my materials made. I really enjoy doing microstructural analysis. I like doing that using traditional optical microscopes, but I also use electron microscopy as well. So doing things like uh, uh, backscatter electrons and, uh, and uh, using uh, cathode luminescence to understand the real, the real structural geological history on a micro scale. Once I've done my field analysis and I've done my microstructural analysis, I've got an idea of the kinematics, how these things have moved. And I can then model the stresses that would have been involved in that. And I refer to that as stress inversion analysis. And then ultimately, once I've done that and I've got an idea of the geology and the, the makeup of the, the stress field, I'll move on to my geochemical analysis and try to figure out the actual timing of these events. So really it's about trying to bring as many structures together as possible. Looking at structures on their own can only give you a small snapshot of the geological history of a particular area. So what we really want to do is bring as many of these structures together as possible. And by doing that, we will be able to constrain an apparent stress field that allowed all of those structures to form. Some of the typical things we go looking for are conjugate faults. So faults that uh, intersect each other at an angle of approximately 60 degrees. When we find those in the field, we can relate them back to rock deformation experiments. And we know that these things form in a very particular stress field where sigma two is parallel to the line of intersection between the two faults. And sigma one is the acute angle bisector and sigma three is the obtuse angle bisector. But conjugate faults aren't particularly common. And we are making assumptions that if we see faults intersecting each other at 60 degrees, that they formed at the same time. And that's not necessarily always true. They are really nice to find in the field and they can give you a nice snapshot there and then of the sort of stress field that you're looking at. So the photographs here is two alternative uh, sets of conjugate structures. So in the left hand image, you can see that the acute angle is upward pointing and that suggests a sigma one must fit in there. So we've got a, a vertical sigma one principal stress field and a horizontal sigma three. However, in the right hand image, you can see that the whole scenario has flipped. And in this case, we've got a horizontal sigma one and a vertical sigma three. So on the left hand image, we're looking at uh, an area that will be dominated by extension and normal faulting. And in the right hand image, we've got a, a scenario where we're dominated by compression and reverse faulting. Of course, where you've got conjugate faults, it can be quite easy then to or constrain an approximate stress field. But very often, instead of seeing just simple conjugate faults, we will see multiple fault sets in more of a polymodal set. As you get into polymodal sets, things become more complicated and it becomes harder to actually constrain the exact orientations of these. What we need to do is get better controls on the kinematics. How are these things moving? So the first thing to look at is actually the geometry of the faults, how they relate to each other. Are they stepping over each other? Do they bend into each other? Are we seeing things like releasing bends or, can, or restraining bends, where in releasing beds, we'll see the formation of new minerals forming in pull-aparts and in dilational jogs? And in restraining beds, we'll see things like stylolites forming, maybe cataclasite forming, some crush zones. That gives us an idea if we're looking at uh, normal faults, reverse faults, sinistral, dextral. So we're getting closer to understanding how these things actually move. But by far and away, the best structure to find in the field for doing any of this kind of analysis are, is things that indicate the actual fault slip direction. And the best thing for that are slicken lines, where we see some frictional abrasion on a fault surface, and it might be accompanied by some orientated mineral growth. 
the lineation that you are seeing in the field there on those fault surfaces are pointing in exactly the direction that that fault moved. And they may be uh, accompanied by some groove or plow marks where things have really dug into the fault surface. You can see these on a much bigger scale. So when we see them on a much bigger scale, we refer to them generally as corrugation lineations, where the fault zone itself or the fault surface itself is corrugated. And those corrugations will almost invariably be parallel to the slip direction of our fault. So now we've got a really, really good constraint on how these faults are moving. To add to that, we can start looking at the secondary structures around our main faults, those other brittle shears. So you may have encountered these before. There's a whole array of them, and depending on the orientation of them and where they are in, in relation to the main tensional field, we can either have uh, slipping faults or slipping secondary structures or dilating secondary structures. And they can fall into being uh, redel shears or uh, P shears or tension cracks. How well developed your fault is will determine how developed those secondary structures are. What we can see in an early stage of fault development are redel shears, your main redel shears are very well developed. But as fault zones develop, they become a bit more destroyed as fracture becomes more progressive. progressive. But we start to see, we start to see them losing, but we start to see a true going slip surface labeled M in this case. And as it continues, you will see additional slip surface forming. But by getting to grips with the orientation of all these various slip surfaces around our primary slip surface, again, we can get constraints on the overall movement direction of these faults. <clears throat> 